million years and sea levels will rise three to six feet that's almost two meters droughts over 40 percent of inhabited land hundreds of millions of refugees and half of all known species extent <coughs> this is what the world will look like at four degrees peak oil is also a very important issue because we're so dependent on oil basically almost everything is made of oil these days we use oil for uh, petrochemicals for fertilizer for cars plastics soaps just everything you could think of is probably a derivative of oil oil peaked at, in around 2005 uh, which means the production levels after that, that time period will never again be as much. Like we will never produce uh, as much oil that, than we have previously produced. And you can see that basically in the next 40 years we're pretty much running out of this. Before that happens, there is a series of things happening because the price is going to start getting more and more expensive, which is which going to affect uh, transportation, logistics, uh, the cost of production of so many things. So the world that we gotten used to will no longer exist. And that's a very, very important thing to understand, that we cannot carry business as usual, that things are changing, and that we need to understand our environment and understand the facts and where we're heading to basically better understand what kind of solutions we can come up with. Oil is an amazing resource. Basic, it's practically free energy. And it's what allowed us to do everything that we've done in the last 150 years. Uh, one barrel of oil produces as much work as 10 people working full time all year. That's one barrel of oil. It costs the US government about a dollar to produce one barrel that let's say they get from Iraq. One dollar per barrel. That, that equals 25,000 hours of work, of human labor. That is what has allowed us to basically do what we've done. That's what allowed us to have this consumption and uh, providing for so much. But it's, it's only a small phase and it's not going to last. What would happen if this 25,000 hours of work have to be done by actual humans. How is that going to be organized? When we run out of oil and it's back to uh, human labor in most cases, how are we going to organize our societies? Um, this is an interesting book, basically, uh, just like oil is peaking and information is peaking, and really, it's peak everything. Uh, we've just came and, and destroyed everything in the last 150 years. For example, with agriculture, uh, we destroyed about 2 billion hectares of farmland, of fertile farmland in the last 6,000 years. Two billion. One billion of it was in the last century alone. So it's something that it, it took us 6,000 years to lose one billion hectares and now it only took 100 years to lose one hectare. So it's one billion hectares. It's, 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 again, it's exponential. Uh, there is talk, and 
it's an idea that's gaining ground that there is even a man-made geological epoch that we actually changed things and corrupted things and altered things so much that this is the first time that Earth is entering a man-made geological epoch called the Anthropocene. Right now, or at least since the last 12,000 years, we've been living in what is called the Holocene. Now, uh, experts basically agree that we've entered into some kind of new phase, a new epoch that just has its own randomness, which they call the Anthropocene. So that's, that's the first. All this being said, uh, th these are some of the options for our future. This is a graph made by uh, David Holmgren, which, is, which was the co-creator or uh, co-founder of the permaculture concept. And basically he gives us four possible scenarios. Uh, either we're going to go into a techno fantasy, either we, we're going to come up with some kind of technologies after oil and basically keep going crazy and keep consuming as much and uh, populations increasing and just keep doing what we're doing. Uh, very unlikely, but but it is possible. I mean, just like we discovered oil, we can, we can also come up with some technologies to sustain us. Uh, there is green tech stability, and, and that's kind of uh, more people becoming sensitive, more people um, adapting uh, green lifestyles, growing their own food, um, local economies, things like that. That also will, will need a, a particular level of organization and, and ambition, which is also unlikely but, but possible. The one in red is an absolute crash and that's what happened to a lot of civilizations before us. Um, and if we keep doing what we're doing, that, that's basically the, the road that we're heading towards. The blue line, Earth stewardship, is what permaculture and kind of advocates. And that's regenerative design, intelligent design, and uh, people at all levels really start implementing and uh, changing the way our politics, our education, uh, and just how we do business. So those are basically four uh, main possible futures. That's where permaculture comes in. That's where the fun begins. Okay. So permaculture is, uh, the word itself is a contraction of permanent and agriculture, but also of permanent culture because we're trying to build a permanent culture, a sustainable culture. Uh, it's a design science that's, that has ethics and basically tries to design human settlement human settlements that are sustainable and that mimic nature because basically nature is the best designer. So this is living with the earth uh, and actually creating regeneration. Some other names for permaculture, I mean I, I don't personally like the, the name and to give you a better idea, a better understanding uh, regenerative design, ecological design, ecological engineering, conscious design, these are all basic, you could use any of these words to describe what, what a permaculture design would do. It has three main sources of inspiration. 
Uh, Bill Mollison is the founder of the permaculture concept and he's a scientist and a, a naturalist. He had to travel to a lot of places and gather a lot of indigenous wisdoms and see how uh, traditional practices are and kind of assess what is sustainable and what is unsustainable. He learned that a lot of these indigenous cultures had very, very deep understanding of how nature worked. They also had ethics. They did not waste, they respected the earth, which is something that we don't really understand anymore. So that's one of the uh, inspiring factors. Um, another source of inspiration is just nature, observing natural systems and trying to mimic how nature designs itself, how a uh, forest, for example, grows, and what are the kind of different dynamics between the, the different components of each system. And thirdly, science. So uh, we've reached a certain level of knowledge and know-how through the scientific, through scientific and technological progress which have allowed us to understand things much, much better now. And so this synergy between these three sources is what really uh, created permaculture. It has uh, three main ethics. Care for the earth, basically anything we do, we have to be caring for the earth and regenerating, not actually hurting or degrading landscapes. We're actually fixing, we're healing, 